Good, good evening, folks, uh, and welcome to the Culinary Historians of Chicago's monthly Zoomcast. I'm Scott Warner, president of this wonderfully eclectic food organization that has now been around for 27 years, pandemic or not. Tonight's presentation, Someone's in the Kitchen with Dinah, presented by someone who worked closely with the American singing legend and culinary star, Dinah Shore, Flo Selfman who's uh, owner of the Los Angeles, Los Angeles agency Selfman and Others Public Relations and, uh, and an editor, um, worked closely with Dinah many years ago when she had her uh, TV show. Some, and uh, Flo helped Dinah prepare her cookbook. And Flo's going to tell you all about her background on that. I first saw Flo give this talk for the Culinary Historians of Southern California or Flo is a board member. I watched it on Zoom a couple of months ago, and I thought that would be great to have her do it in Chicago. And I was, and I remembered how much I loved Dinah Shore, and that was the first thing I saw when I was a little kid watching her on TV. Um, and I remembered uh, uh, she was known for her Chevy, Chevy commercial, see the USA in your Chevrolet. And I thought it would be nice tonight to have Dinah here as a warm-up act for Flo. So we're gonna present a few, few seconds of Dinah for you and Dinah's gonna bring Flo on. Here she goes. Let's go. See the USA in your Chevrolet. The Rockies way out west are calling you. Drive your Chevrolet through the USA where fields of golden wheat pass and review. Whether traveling lighter with a load that's heavy. Performance is sweeter, nothing can beat her. Life is completer in a Chevy. So make a taste today to see the USA and see it in your Chevrolet. Hi, everybody. I'm Flo Selfman talking to you from beautiful, sunny Southern California. And Scott, I'm so happy you played that clip because otherwise I might have been tempted to sing that jingle myself and I would have <laughs> lost my audience before I even began. So um, I'm really happy to be here. I love talking about Dinah. It was a long, long time ago, a long yesterday, as my mother would say. But um, I think a lot of you will be familiar with her. And for those who aren't, she was an enormous star back in the 40s and the 50s and 60s and 70s. She had a five decade career. Uh, she actually was, was, was born in Tennessee, a town called Winchester in, in, um, in 1916 or 17, depending on who you talk to. Uh, her birthday was March 29th, leap year day. And uh, her parents were Russian Jewish immigrants and they were storekeepers. When Dinah was, uh, was uh, 18 months old, she contracted polio and she had a very intensive regimen of treatment, uh, largely due to her mother. She had massages, exercises, uh, sports when she was old enough to do them and uh, all kinds of, of therapy that helped her overcome uh, the polio. Yeah, so anyway, when, uh, when she got a little bit older, her parents, the family moved to uh, McMinnville, Tennessee, and her parents had a uh, department store, and Dinah was always singing. I mean, she probably sang before she could talk, and she did recall at one time uh, being a child, and actually every day she, she would be at the store, and they would put her up on top of the counter, and she would sing for the patrons of the store, and I, I'm sure it helped sales. But she obviously was, was not afraid of, of audiences and performing from, from practically from babyhood. So as time went on, um, when she got to be 16 years old, her mother unfortunately died from a heart attack. And around that time, just Dinah went into college. So she went to Vanderbilt University. And I will say that um, Dinah has sort of peripherally been a, a part of my family since I can remember because my uncle, my father's brother, went to medical school at Vanderbilt and they lived in Nashville for five years. I, I, I think it, they may have been there at around the same time, although there were, uh, you know, he was older. But Dinah was also one of the first performers to uh, perform for the troops in, in World War II. She, she, did, um, she did USO tours with Bob Hope. 
But when she when she went to college, she was also singing at the college radio station and was offered a contract. And her older sister, who was married at the time, uh, they advised her against signing a contract and going to New York and sh that she should finish her college. So she did get a degree from Vanderbilt and then went to New York. So she was singing on the radio and uh, one of the DJs, she was singing a song called Dinah and one of the DJs uh, kept calling her that Dinah girl. Her name actually was, uh, was uh, Frances Rose Shore. So she adopted uh, Dinah as her, as her stage name. And I think that was a good move. Dinah Shore just has a really happy ring to it, I think. Uh, when she was singing in New York, she met another young singer who went on to great fame. His name was Frank Sinatra and they became lifelong friends. So um, Dinah was a big star. How big was she? How about 175 singles, 40 albums, numerous TV shows and radio appearances and her own shows. Um, she even has more than a dozen film credits, although acting was not something that she particularly uh, liked. She has three stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So if you happen to be out here and you see one beneath your feet, and you go around the corner and see another one, it's not a mistake. She has stars on the Walk of Fame for radio, recording, and television. So um, she also uh, was ranked number 16 by TV Guide in their list of the top 50 television stars of all time. Uh, stylistically, she was compared to two singers who followed her, uh, Doris Day and Patti Page. And uh, just, uh, just a little sad note I will, I will mention, in June of 2019, the New York Times Magazine listed Dinah as among hundreds of artists whose material was reportedly destroyed in the 2008 Universal Studios fire. And that's something that just is so hard to contemplate, all the priceless things, not only from Dinah, that were destroyed at that time. So, how did I get to work with Dinah? And it was funny, even being a kid, you know, I would sometimes come across a little movie magazine or something. And I read about Dinah Shore and George Montgomery and Missy Montgomery and Jody Montgomery. And if anybody had told me that I would grow up and I'd be living in California and I'd be hanging out with Missy Montgomery, I would have told them they were totally crazy. But life is funny, as we all know. So I was picked by Kelly Girl, which is a temp office, uh, you know, provider of office help. And I was picked for a two week job to go to Dinah Shore's house in Beverly Hills. <clears throat> I believe I was handpicked for this job because I had a college degree. I could type 65 words a minute. And I guess I was presentable enough to be sent to the home of a big star. So her house at the time was right behind the famed Beverly Hills Hotel, which is on Sunset Boulevard, on Main Street out here. And it was just north of the hotel. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. I drove by it a few months ago and there's a, uh, anyway, totally different house than where that used to be. But it was a lovely cottage style house, a single story. And uh, uh, it had a circular driveway in front and some beautiful flowers that I had never seen before. They're called California poppies. I just love them. So I'm going to tell you what this, um, before I'll do that, I just would look at, uh, draw your attention to the first slide that you're looking at. Uh, the Dinosaur Chevy show was primarily music and skits is what the, most of the shows were at that time. And Dinah was very well known for her gowns, as you can see at the lower uh, left of your screen. Uh, that, that slide is for a uh, contest, see the USA in your Chevrolet contest, but you can see she's wearing a beautiful ball gown and um, a nice Chevy and a nice little Corvette there. Uh, the slide at the top, she's taping a commercial. So she's sitting in a Chevy convertible, taping a commercial. And then the, the slide on the right is, is an ad for the show that was on Sundays at 8 p.m. And when we were at my aunt and uncle's house on a Sunday, I, the minute it got to be 10 to eight or five to eight, my aunt would zoom over to the TV and all of us would follow her and we'd all sit there and watch the Dinosaur Chevy show come hell or high water. So once I got to, to sent to Dinah's house, this is what I saw. 
the house, as I say, was very lovely. And when you came in, there was a foyer and then there was a, a, a big hallway that went to the left and to the right. And to the, to the right was a powder room, a wall of cabinets on the, on the left. And in those cabinets, first of all, something I had not seen before, there were one cabinet was a lot of vertical dividers to store serving trays. So for all you culinary people listening, uh, it, that's something that would be really wonderful. I mean, I don't know about your house, but in my house, they're all stacked one on top of another. So this was beautiful. In the cupboard next to that, she had a jukebox. And this jukebox could be programmed with LP records for four continuous hours of music. I mean, it sounds kind of quaint, but this was a huge deal. Next to that was a huge den. It was one of my favorite rooms because it has my favorite thing in it. When you go in on the right, there was a built-in wet bar and on the perpendicular wall, there was an alcove with a love seat. And on the wall above the love seat were seven circular lucite shelves, each one containing an Emmy statuette. And I believed at the time and still do today that it is the most beautiful of all the awards. So to see, to see seven of them, you know, it's, it's just, it was just really warmed my heart. On the right was a guest pow beautiful guest powder room. And then there were two, two offices that were formerly her kids' bedrooms. At that time, Melissa was on her own and Jody was in school back East. So these, and, and with the new show, uh, they, they needed uh, office space. So the bedrooms had been converted to offices. And then at the far end was Dinah's suite, which was really very lovely. I don't, only saw it one time, but I, I, um, I was just blown over by the closet, which was not only a walk-in closet, it was a room, it was a whole room. And it had racks of everything divided by, you know, blouses on one and pants on another one. And then a big display case with drawers in the center, uh, really very beautiful. So um, on, the, on the left was the uh, kitchen, which I'll show you in a minute, but straight ahead was this living room. And what you're looking at here is actually only half of it because uh, there's an, another, another half that would be closer to where you enter. But I, re I clearly remember this, this furniture was really, uh, as I remember it actually, it was a little lighter color of coral, but it was kind of quilted, which was the fashion of the time. And the defining feature was this gigantic window, which is so beautiful. It actually was the inspiration for uh, the logo of the, of the program. So I don't know, I'll show, see if you can see this. You can see it right here. These are nailing labels that we had for Dinah's Place, but it was inspired by this big window. So Dinah's Kitchen was really quite spectacular. It had been redone a couple of years by St. Charles Kitchen a couple of years before I worked in the house. And uh, I remember just being blown away by that brick arch. It's very large, you know, there's a restaurant style oven, uh, the rack of copper cookware, all of which got used by the way. And uh, the cabinet on the left actually contained some smaller appliances like juicers and you could open the cabinet, but looks like drawers, but you could also press a button and the uh, item would rise to the, the surface, which was kind of cool. In the foreground, you'll see a wooden table, and this is all set up for the photo, photo shoot, so it's not what it really looked like, but this uh, kind of large wooden table, I ate lunch many a time at that table, and, uh, and oftentimes when Jody was home from school, uh, Dinah's former husband, George Montgomery, would come by the house, and so uh, he and I shared, uh, shared uh, had lunch together at this table on occasion. George was a wonderful guy. If you don't know a lot about him, look him up because he was not only a famous actor, um, he was an art collector. His family was Russian, not, not Russian Jewish, but Russian. Um, he was a collector of Russian art, Western art, and he was a, an incredible woodworker. In fact, see, everything relates to food. The, George made a dining set uh, early American style, a big round table with a built-in Lazy Susan and eight captain's chairs. And he made those for Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and their family. 
And how I knew that is because I went to the Roy Rogers Museum at Victorville in the heart of the Apple Valley. And I don't even remember where that is, but it's probably an hour, hour and a half from here. And the first thing I saw when I went inside was this dining set and a photograph on the wall showing it in the house of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. And it said that it was made by George Montgomery. So I thought that was pretty exciting. Here's the kitchen again, Dinah at the kitchen. And um, you can see this plaid carpet, which is kind of interesting. And she's cooking. Now, Dinah was, has been cooking her entire life, pretty much. And she was an instinctive cook. So when she was going to do her first cookbook, Dinah Shore, uh, someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. Um, she had to ha had, she didn't have her recipes written down because she didn't know how much of anything she used. So her friends would come over and they would cook together. And sometimes we would get called in to taste different recipes. So we were her beta tasters. Uh, we'd get, get a phone call and come in the kitchen and we'd be handed a plate, let's say, with three sample servings of three different veal dishes and we would give our opinions. So we all had something to do with making the cookbook. Um, she had various uh, of her friends who would come over and cook with her. Uh, and and uh, Jeremy Tarcher was her publishing consultant. Um, and he uh, subsequently had his own uh, publishing company. Uh, and just by the way, his wife was Sherry Lewis, the puppeteer who had the little lamb chop puppet. So everything is sort of connected one way or another. This is, this is the cookbook. Uh, and, and some of you probably have it. Apparently there are a lot of copies around. Uh, it says at the bottom, Dinah tells exactly how she prepares over 200 of her favorite recipes in her own kitchen. Now she was a lifelong athlete because she got started with swimming uh, and tennis and so forth, but, but, or some of, the, some of these activities when she was still recovering from polio. Supposedly she had a little bit of residual limp and uh, something, but I never saw any evidence of it. Uh, in her cookbook, uh, it has the usual sections of main dishes and so forth. Uh, but she talks in the beginning about her orientation to food and how she how she acquired some of the recipes that she shares in the cookbook. If she was traveling in another country and she had a great meal, she would meet the chef and she would get the recipe or if she was in a hotel. So, you know, she she had recipes from from a lot of different places. Uh, she also has a section in the book about entertaining. Uh, she loved to entertain. One of the things that she uh, uh, her tips is that she has a long, she had a long dining room table and she would seat men on one side and women on the other side and not, and not couples next to each other because she said, you do everything together. You don't have to be together at a party, but she's decided that women on one side and men on the other side that they really like to look at, you know, that men like to, to look at all the women and women like to look at all the men, which is kind of a cute idea. Uh, one of her best food tips that she practiced in her life is that she never took seconds. Now that's pretty hard, but I mean, think about Thanksgiving. You know, I get used to get so sick after Thanksgiving because anyway, never mind. But it's a great tip to never take seconds. And you can see from the picture that she had a really lovely fit trim figure. And part of that I think is by following her own advice. And the other part of it is by living an active lifestyle because tennis was a very big part of her life from very, very early on her entire life. Um, it's an amazing sport apparently that people can do, uh, do very, uh, through their entire lifetimes. Uh, another thing that Dinah did is she would take naps. And uh, I kind of learned to take naps from Dinah, which is a really good thing. I mean, and those of us who work at home, we have that option to take naps. So I ex exercise that option when I'm up too late, which is most of the time. Uh, now, what I want to tell you is there were three people in the house that I, uh, three women in the house. And these are all people that were very instrumental to this story. The first one is Shirley. Shirley was Dinah's secretary for a long time. I think she had probably been with Dinah for probably more than 10 years at the time I arrived at the house. And the, Shirley loved me because she loved talking about grammar and punctuation. And she would corner me and that happens to be a strong suit of mine. And we would talk about grammar and punctuation all the time. So that was Shirley's favorite thing. 
Uh, the other person was Pauline. Pauline was Dinah's housekeeper and she had been with Dinah for years. In fact, if you were to ask her, she would have taken credit for raising Dinah's kids. Pauline was an older woman, she had gray hair. She used to wear a gray uh, uniform with a white collar and cuffs. And she turned 65 while I was there. I remember that because she was so proud. She came into the kitchen and announced, I just turned 65, I'm getting my social security. Uh, she lived at the house. There was a, a suite on the other side of the kitchen uh, where she stayed during the week. And then on the weekends, she went to her own house. But she was a crusty broad. She was just, she was fun. She had one of those personalities that you never knew if she was, you know, yelling at you for sure, or if she was, that was just her personality. And, and her little quirk, if you want to call it that, was that she loved to watch the soap opera General Hospital, which came on NBC every day at three o'clock in the afternoon. And she had a little TV in the kitchen and she watched it without fail. One day she had to leave the house during the time her soap was on. She had to go down to the market in Beverly Hills and she made Shirley come into her kitchen and watch the soap on TV and take it down in shorthand and read it back to her when she got back from the market. So I was in the kitchen having lunch one day and complimenting uh, Pauline on whatever she had fixed. And I said, oh, Pauline, how do you fix this? And I have a feeling that it was her cottage cheese and blueberry pancakes, which I loved and it's in the cookbook. So I said, Pauline, this is delicious. How do you fix this? Pauline grabs this battered saucepan off the stove, slams it down on the stove and says, well, Florence, first you take a damn pot. And that was Pauline. Number three was Bessie. Now, when I went there, the reason I was hired is because Dinah's show, Dinah's Place had just come on the air. Uh, I, think, I think it came on the air in August and I went there in September. Uh, the show was designed, it was a half hour show on NBC in the morning. And it was, uh, I think in Los Angeles, it came on at 9 a.m. and other places it was on at 10 a.m. Because I remember I would stand at the mirror and getting ready from nine to 9.30 and then the TV was in my bedroom and I would watch the show. And then at 9.30, I would get in my car and run over to Dinah's house. So um, the thing about the show is that it was designed to be a magazine show. Now this had not been done before. Most of the shows, as I mentioned earlier, they were variety shows. So there were music and skits. And then of course there were the soaps and there was news and there was not a lot else. So this was a, a designed to have all the elements of a woman's magazine. So if you can imagine what's in there, you know, it's childcare, makeup tips, fashion, health tips, nutrition, and of course recipes and cooking advice. So all of these elements were in the show. Now that's an awful lot to pack into a half hour show. And in reality, it's a 22 minute show because when you take out the commercials and the, the uh, intros and the lead ins and the lead outs, you know, you've got even less than 22 minutes. So if you've got somebody on the show doing an exercise demo or a cooking demo, you're leaving, you're giving just teasers to the, to the audience. So at this time, you know, we're talking pre-internet, we're talking pre uh, shows didn't have newsletters and and uh, everything. So it was all really done by mail. So people started writing letters. So that was why I ended up there. I was there to work with this woman named Bessie on answering Dinah's fan mail. Now, uh, uh, the, mail, the mail that was coming in at, the, at that time was um, a large, a lot of it was from people who were familiar with Dinah from, from before because uh, she had left... TV in around the uh, early 60s, and she didn't come back on TV until 1970 when Dinah's Place came on the air. So people were saying, oh, I've always loved you. You know, I'm so glad, glad to see you back on the air. So, and they didn't want anything. They just said, you know, I'm glad to see you back on the air. And a lot of them said, I was born in the same year as you, 1917. So that's why I said 16 or 17, depending on who you listen to. Um, so at that time, Bessie would create, uh, we had this beautiful uh, letterhead, white with the red, red uh, embossed logo of Dinah's Place. 
uh, and Bessie would create an answer. Basically, you know, dear Ms. So-and-so, oh, I should say at that time, we, we who knew how to type and type well, and I could say it was men and women too. I worked for bosses, they were expert typewriters. We knew how to type a letter somehow and have it centered vertically on the page and type without mistakes. I can't do that anymore. But when, when that's all we did is type, you know, we were per perfect typists. Um, so we would have a, 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 a letter that would say, dear so-and-so, you know, thank you for taking the time to write. And basically um, it, it always said, please keep watching our show. Well, the show is sponsored, you know, and the way it stays on is by selling, you know, the purpose of shows is to sell soap. Uh, so to speak. I mean, back even before that, when radio programs were invented, the radio was invented before the program. So they had uh, radio ads, and then there was programming to be filler between the radio ads, which I think were from real estate at that time. So we had a, a fabulous sponsor, which was Colgate. It's a major sponsor. So if you're going to watch the program, theoretically, you're going to watch the Colgate commercials, and you're going to buy their products, and the show gets to stay on the air. So Dinah also believed that everyone who wrote deserved an answer. And being the genteel Southern lady that she was, it had to really be reflective of her. Now, about a couple of days, two or three days into my time at Dinah's house, uh, this woman, Bessie, was a very attractive. She was tall, uh, older, very lined in the face with a halo of gray white hair and a very, uh, uh, I'll say forceful in a positive way, personality. And a couple of days later, I just, I had a feeling that she was related to Dinah. And I asked her, I said, Bessie, are you related? And she said, why, yes, I'm Dinah's sister. And she was so happy to be asked. And I will tell you that that was a, de a defining moment in my life, because if I had said what I was thinking, uh, I don't know where I would be at this moment, but it wouldn't be here talking to you. So. When I mentioned earlier that Dinah's older sister, she was about eight years older, was married at the time and advised Dinah to stay in school. This was the very same Bessie. I didn't put all of that together because I didn't know Dinah's background at that time. So it turns out that I'm working with Dinah's sister. And when Dinah and George Montgomery got divorced after about 20 years of marriage, Bessie handled Dinah's fan mail. So who better to handle her fan mail now with her new show than her sister? So that's why this all came about. So that's who all was in the house with Dinah at that time. Now, as the time went on and the mail, uh, we got more and more mail and people started asking for things. So then they were asking for recipes. They were asking for where to buy the cute little dress that she had on this morning's show and where can I get it in Peoria and not being aware that it cost $450 then and was from Giorgio's in Beverly Hills. But we created answers for all these things. Now, in the beginning, Dinah actually signed every letter. So, at, you know, at, at night, there would be a stack of letters and she would read them and she would sign them. So whoever got wrote to her very early on um, had letters signed by Dinah. As time went on and uh, we got more and more letters, I think we had a Dinah Shore stamp. And then we and then we were signing them like uh, writing them as Miss Shore has asked me to say X and we would sign it with our own name and, you know, uh, whatever title we had at, at, at that point. So uh, at some point when it looked like we were actually an integral part of the, of, the, of the TV staff, our office was moved from the house down to the studio, which at that time was KTLA Studios on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Even though the show was broadcast over NBC, it was taped at, uh, at KTLA, which was uh, one of our local uh, channels. So we had a huge suite of offices and then there was a huge uh, set that was built uh, at the studio. So um, the, the mail really started coming in and what we were creating, there were so many things going on. There were so many different topics and everything. And we, we were responsible really for sending the information to the, to the viewers who wrote in. So we created, we created responses and then eventually we actually just got kind of a form letter that would, uh, that would say, you know, thank you for writing, please keep watching the show. And, you know, we've enclosed the information you requested. So we would enclose a Xerox copy of a, of a recipe or uh, 
some things that were kind of interesting. This was very creative for me because it was whatever was needed, we created. So for example, I would be in the green room, which by the way is never green. You've heard of green rooms before at TV studios, one of my favorite places, uh, watching on the monitor where let's say Peter Lupus, who was uh, the weightlifter from the original Mission Impossible, he, he became a regular on the show. If he was doing a demonstration of exercises, I was actually sitting there with a tablet and making stick figures to draw the positions. And then I would create a text to go with it that would be readable and, and something that people could follow. And then there were occasions where I would actually have to get in touch with the celebrity and get more information. I remember there was something I wrote, uh, wrote to Dom DeLuise who had been on the show and I have a note from him and he wrote back and he didn't know the answer, but he wrote me a personal note and thanked me. And so, I mean, it just, these things are just so much fun. So here is Dinah in her set kitchen. And there's something very important that went on here. Um, the segment, the cooking segments, either Dinah cooked or her guests would cook. And uh, you've seen cooking shows before where, where the person uh, the, prepares a dish and they open up the oven and they put the dish in the oven. And 10 minutes later, even though the baking time is 90 minutes, they open it up and there it is already cooked. So the oven has a back door, right? In the back of that, there's another kitchen. So who's in the kitchen with Dinah? This is critical. A woman named Lisa Fleming, who I got to be, I got to be quite good friends with Lisa. Really lovely, just down to earth, hardworking, and never complained, and the best cook. She was able to create all these dishes that Dinah was doing with her guests. And I'm sure she had to do more than more than one in the back in case something happened. So when Dinah opened up the oven for the finished product, Lisa had already been cooking it in the back and put it in the oven for Dinah to, to retrieve. And then she and her guests would taste it. And they that's the part I always hate, where they taste it, like, mm, isn't that delicious? Well, what if they said, you know, there's too much salt in this? You know, I'm sure that probably uh, some comedian would say that. But um, so one time, Lisa was, um, <laughs> If there was anything left, we would eat it. But sometimes uh, there was there was a lot left. And I walked into the kitchen one time, uh, the backstage kitchen, and Lisa had a casserole or something, and she was pouring it down the disposal. And I said, Lisa, what are you doing? And she said, it's not food to me, Flo, it's props. I've never forgotten that, because I guess maybe coming from an immigrant background, you never threw food down the disposal, but I never forgot that she said that. And it's a totally different orientation. Uh, she did actually go into the restaurant business. I believe she took, uh, uh, she took a course in restaurant management afterwards. So that's who was in the kitchen with Dinah at that point. Now, you remember this guy that she met when they were teenagers. Frank Sinatra was her first guest on the show and they were preparing Frank Sinatra's marinara sauce now, Dinah told a story in the cookbook of going to the airport with Frank, and he was telling her, uh, describing a recipe for, uh, and she wrote it down and tried to prepare it and realized there was something missing. He just, just happened to not tell her that there was wine in it. So the variety of guests was absolutely astounding, and it wasn't just celebrities who were on TV plugging something. That actually came later. Uh, a person could come on a show like this because he had an interesting thing to talk about. So, but all of her friends, you know, she, she had so many friends. A lot of times, and when I went into PR afterwards, I realized that when there's a new show, sometimes a celebrity doesn't want to go on a new show until it's proven itself. But in Dinah's case, you know, people would come on because it was Dinah and it was a network show. And actually I'm thinking about Bob Hope, that was his network anyway. Dinah with Rose Kennedy. Now the recipe that she prepared for Rose Kennedy is something I had never heard of at the time. It was creme brulee. And I've never made it. I don't think I've ever even had it, but just reading about creme brulee is so visual to me and so sensory. I absolutely love it. And there were so many political people who were on the show of both parties. And I will name some of these for you. 
uh, you might recognize these folks. This is Sergeant Shriver and to the right, Eunice Shriver. You will know them as the parents of Maria Shriver, but uh, Sergeant Shriver was a diplomat and Eunice Shriver they, was the creator of Special Olympics. So these were really wonderful people. Some of the other uh, political people who were on the show, uh, Senator Barry Goldwater, Spiro Ag Spiro Agnew, Trisha Nixon Cox, Eleanor McGovern, who was the wife of the Democratic presidential candidate George McGovern. Oh, he prepares, he's preparing an omelet here. Uh, Senator William Proxmire, Margaret Truman Daniel, um, Mrs. Everett Jerkson, the wid widow of the late senator. She discussed her book and the subject of widowhood. Uh, Maureen Dean, wife of the former White House counsel. Uh, uh, a lot of sports figures were on the show, including Larry Zonka from the Miami Dolphins, Bobby Riggs, Wilt Chamberlain, Yvonne Gulagong, the tennis player, Alex Karras, Frank Gifford, Willie Mays, um, who I actually met, Sugar Ray Robinson, Hank Aaron was on with his fiance right after he had uh, broken that hitting record. Uh, so a lot of the shows dealt with topics that were not just women's magazine topics. I will give Bessie credit for a great deal of this. Bessie Dinah's sister was not a showbiz type. She was married to a physician and um, she was more into social welfare and, and, and politics. And she was very active in some organizations. And thanks to Bessie, uh, she would go to the producers and go to the production meetings and make suggestions about topics that should be dealt with. So on this, you know, cute, fluffy little morning show, they talked about abortion. They talked about adoption. They talked about child abuse. Uh, they had one program that was very moving to me, and it was with Shirley Temple Black, the former child star who had become an ambassador. And she had been operated on for breast cancer, and she was interviewed from uh, from her hospital bed at Cedars and her husband was there with her. She had had breast cancer surgery a week earlier and she talked about how supportive he was. And this was something that was, again, it sounded new to me. You know, we're talking the early 1970s. And, um, and this was a subject that had not been talked about publicly, maybe on a soap opera, maybe on a newscast, but not certainly on a women's show, a so-called women's show. Uh, there was some, there was another one that was moving to me. Uh, the performer Nanette Fabre, who was a Broadway uh, uh, a singer and, and actress, um, she had a severe hearing loss, and she talked about that on the show. I thought that was quite fascinating uh, because you know, especially nowadays, you know, people don't want to sound like they have an imperfection. It might interfere with them getting work. But she talked about hearing loss. She came on the show another time, not long after her husband had died suddenly. And when that happened, she discovered that she knew nothing about being an adult. She didn't know how to balance a checkbook. She didn't know how to write a check. She, her husband took care of everything and she had people who did it. And she really came on to talk about it as a cautionary tale and advise women not to, not to be in that position to start you know, taking charge of their own, of their own stuff. Uh, we had some some uh, powerhouse women on the show. There was one program in particular, I recall, where three uh, very successful women were the guests. One of them was Jean Neidich, the founder of Weight Watchers. Another one was Marilyn Lewis, who with her husband, Harry Lewis, founded the Hamburger Hamlet chain of restaurants. But Marilyn Lewis was also the fashion designer known as Cardinale. And the third person was Ruth Handler, who was the, one of the chief executives of the Mattel toy company. And again, this was wonderful, uh, wonderful to have all three of these women on the same program. Uh, they had Ramona Ripston, who was head of the ACLU. And I remember being the young, innocent Ohio kid that I was, uh, Ramona Ripston was a very attractive woman. She had masses of blonde hair and she was really beautiful. And I didn't know that people could be so smart and so powerful and so, you know, so with such leadership qualities and still be beautiful. I honestly didn't know that. Um, without, you know, oh, she even had Phyllis Schlafly, 
who was the uh, opposite of of a feminist. She was, I guess, the anti-feminist. We had her. I mean, we really went across the board. A, a lot of a lot of food related topics were talked talked about, not just uh, not just cooking. I mean, a lot of nutrition. Uh, Dr. Adele Davis was on a number of times. There were a lot of nutritionists who were on, and uh, we had Jerry. Uh, Jerry Baker, who was the master gardener, so he talked uh, not only about house plants, but you know, talked about vegetables. Uh, we had Merle Ellis and his wife Neva from Northern California who came down, and Merle Ellis was a butcher, and so he did all these shows talking about the different cuts of meat. And this is stuff. I mean, it's just uh, it, there's just so much learning. And again, we we in our fan mail office would prepare the handouts because we we would get sometimes. Um, I remember one two two week period we had something like 750 letters. Have you any idea how long it takes just to slit open 750 letters, and then you have to take the letter out of the envelope, you have to unfold it, and you have to clip it to the envelope, and then you end up with a big stack of letters and you go through them. Well, what Bessie created was that we tabulated every letter that came in with cross hatches. We had a gigantic tablet of graph paper. And we would have one for each show and we would tabulate the letters for each topic. And then every, I forget how often, if it was every two weeks or every month, we would prepare a written report for the producers so they could see what things were going over well and what things were not going over so well. And if we got, you know, 500 requests for a particular recipe or we got one recipe, one request that, that, that didn't like the recipe, but we tabulated everything. So Bessie was able to take all this into the producers and have the influence of, of having these, uh, these programs. Uh, now, I know you've been waiting for this one. We had a lot of chefs on the program and a lot of them I believe got national exposure you know, through Dinah's program. And you can see here, this is Paul Blanger from New Orleans, and he actually created their signature dishes, including trout marguerite, eggs soustard, and trout flanger. Oopsie, Pierre Franey, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but this was later, This he had his own show, and that's his grandson on the kitchen with him. And let me see what I can tell you about Pierre. He, but he prepared trout on the show, and he offered tips on how to freeze sauces and vegetables. Uh, James Beard was on the show. <laughs> he cooked lamb and he also showed how to make braided loaf buttermilk bread. Julia Child was on and she cooked vol. Oh, I, should, I should not give you my French. I'm just not good enough anymore. Volaille en goujonette. He'll know what that is. Uh, we had another, another chef on named Harmony McCoy. Now, Harmony McCoy had been Lionel Hampton's music arranger for many years before he became a well-known chef. He was a, a portly uh, black man, over 300 pounds, and he became a chef, as Dinah put it, at a fat farm. So he was cooking all these 700 a day calorie meals of, you know, chicken neck bones and sauerkraut and not sure what he was eating, but he was, uh, you know, not eating his uh, spa food. Now we have, you'll know him, Graham Kerr, the Galloping Gourmet. And he actually talked about, um, I think he was, I think he's either English or Australian, I forget, but he uh, did a motor trip around the USA and uh, Dinah cooked Cleman's chicken in egg bread, which is in her, uh, in her, in this cookbook. And he prepared mangoes Lamond. Now Cleman's chicken and egg bread was from Cleman's restaurant. Uh, it was a uh, tea house that was very, very popular in, I believe the thirties and forties in Nashville. So there was another dish they were famous for and that was their apple pie and used tart apples and I think um, apricot jam or something and a beautiful lattice crust. I mean, it just sounds wonderful. And then we had the very impressive uh, Bernard Urban of the Royal Coach Hotel in Houston. Uh, he was known for his ice sculptures and clock, uh, chocolate displays. <coughs> and um, hold on, I have another one here. I don't have a picture, but uh, this chef you may have heard of, Roy Andres de Groot. 
He was Esquire's sightless chef and food editor. editor and he prepared a Russian Chris, uh, Christmas dinner, veal, including veal stuffed with cherries. Um, he achieved success as a critic and became an accomplished cook despite nearly total blindness as a result of injuries suffered during the Blitz of London in 1940. He took his own life in 1983 at age 73. He was depressed because of failing health. Well, you can see all these uh, awards that Mr. Urban had achieved. Now we have here the pastry chef from the Drake Hotel in Chicago. Lutz Olkowitz, he was there apparently for 25 years. And after I did my Dinah talk for the culinary historians of Los Angeles, I received a wonderful letter from one of our board members who had lived in Chicago for a long time. And they went to the Drake uh, very often and it was at the same time. So I'm sure that he had Mr. Olkowitz's pastry creations. Uh, yeah, he was there for 25 years and then he was with Sarah Lee. And he showed, I wish I knew the answer to this, how to keep a souffle from collapsing. If you've spent any time in Los Angeles, especially in days gone by, you would be familiar with Perino's restaurant. This was a beautiful building, which unfortunately, it was designed by the famed uh, African-American architect, Paul R. Williams. And it has been torn down, but I had the good fortune of going there on two different occasions. It is the most, it was the most beautiful restaurant inside. It had, the booths were like one step up and they were shell shaped <coughs> in like a pale peach cut velvet. And there were chandeliers, crystal chandeliers and the lighting. I mean, you looked like a movie star, even if you could, no matter what you looked like when you walked in, you'd look like a, a movie star at Perino. So it was sad to see it go. And this is Alex Perino, the owner, the proprietor. And the chef's name was Otillo Baiano, and they prepared chicken Romano. Now we have here Kenneth Hansen from Scandia. And this restaurant, Scandia, was pretty iconic. The restaurant was on the second level, and you drove in uh, right here. It, it was, the, was the valet, and then you had a lobby, and you went upstairs to the restaurant. Oddly enough, I went there with my parents, and it just doesn't seem like the kind of restaurant that they, that what they would have gone to. Um, first of all, because it was very high end. And second of all, it, the decor was very Scandinavian, very heavily. And I don't mean like Danish modern, I mean like dark wood and, and crests and I don't know, Viking helmets and things like that. <laughs> they did have one uh, room that was like a garden room that was painted with green and had lattice and, and rose bushes and things. And I went to a, a wedding, um, uh, you know, bridesmaid thing, uh, shower, a wedding shower at that at that room. But my mother used to order veal Oscar. She used to love ordering something that she would never fix at home. Now, when Mr. Hansen was on the program, he did a dish called Biff a la Rydberg, R-Y-D-B-E-R-G. And this dish was, he recommended to make it in three separate skillets. It had beef in one with different seasonings and different things and potatoes in another and onion in a third. And then they all got combined. And the other thing that he did that I just, just blew my mind. I loved it so much. Uh, I, he brought homemade vodka and it, the bottle was uh, frozen in uh, an ice bucket. And when you pick up the bottle, it's got the ice bucket shape uh, ice clinging to the bottle. I thought that was totally cool. And the glasses that he served it in were not the usual martini glasses, but they were they were V-shaped glasses, but they didn't have a stem. They had kind of a coin-shaped bit of glass. And I'm thinking in my mind that they must have been on some sort of a rack. But you held you held it by this this little uh, tab of glass. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. Food names. Jean Volz, the LA Times food editor, was on in 1971, and she prepared Bulgarian meatball soup. And then um, Sandra Van Oker, the uh, correspondent, and his wife, Edith Van Oker, who she was food editor of the Washington Post, they were on. And then Margaret Happel. Uh, later Margaret Happel Perry, the food and nutrition editor of Red Book for 14 years. And she was a consulting editor of the 22 volume Time Life series, Great Meals in Minutes and many more. And she gave money saving kitchen hints. 
and we had Alexis Bespalov, wine columnist for New York Magazine, and he had most uh, topic that, of course, we all need to know, and that's how making one's own wine cellar. How practical are with that? Now, we can't talk about Dinah's Place and Dinah Shore without talking about Burt Reynolds. Now, uh, they had a very well publicized four year relationship that was a major relationship for both of them. Now she already knew who he was. So she, uh, when, uh, when he came on the show, but the, the pic picture on the left, he's actually stirring something. But what happened before that is he was up in one of these cupboards and he took a flying leap. And uh, then they had to get <laughs> and onto this table and broke it. And she was sit seated at the table. And then they tried to try to try to cook something. Um, the thing that was so remarkable about this relationship, uh, two things really. One is they say opposites attract, and these two people were certainly opposites. Uh, you know, Bert was a, a stunt man, and, and uh, he did all these adventure movies, Smokey and the Bear, and all that. And Dinah was whom we know Dinah to be. Uh, so personality-wise or interest-wise, they were very, very different. And they, like one year, she she had taken the famous artist's course to learn oil painting. And so she got him the famous artist's course as a Christmas gift, and he got her a motorcycle. So I guess they went motorcycle riding. He also bought her a dog, too. It was a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A really, a basset, a basset hound. It was, they named it Gronk. Uh, panel down here on the right. She knew he was going to be on the show that day, but she didn't know that she was going to open a cupboard and he would be in the cupboard. And this was his. So when you see her reaction, it was absolutely hysterical. Uh, something that's important here about uh, about Bert being on the show is that he was on many times. He was on with with Don DeLuise one time. He was on with his his buddies Ham Neat and Hal Needham, who was a very famous stuntman. And they would pull crazy stuff on the show. <clears throat> so what, one time, Bert and, and Dom DeLuise got into a food fight. Another time, Bert and Hal uh, demolished a table. And we heard about it. Letters came pouring in. We got letters like, you know, I can't afford to buy a new couch and you people are breaking up furniture or, you know, we're having a hard time putting food on the table and you rich people out in California are throwing food around. Well, this all got to the producers and believe me, this show was very responsive to the viewers. And so, you know, people were also writing in and saying, you know, we can't afford to buy meat, but here you're showing up how to, how to cut meat and all your recipes have meat in them. So we've featured a lot of meatless recipes. So all of this was taken into consideration. Now, I have one letter I have to tell you about because it, you know I probably read 50, 60,000 letters in the four years I worked there. <laughs> and one was my absolute favorite when it comes to Dinah and Bert. Oh, I forgot to mention the important thing. Dinah was almost 20 years older than Bert or Bert was 20 years younger than Dinah. Either way, it was very remarkable. I mean, we all heard of May-December re relationships but it's usually where the man is older. And in this case, it's where the man was younger. So there was a letter that came in. And at, the, at this time, Dinah did not see the fan mail almost. It was something extraordinary that we felt should really have her personal attention. But there was a letter that came in from a young woman, maybe 21 years old, who lived in the Midwest. And <clears throat> so many of the letters would say, you know, I get my husband off to work and my kids off to school and I sit down and have my second cup of coffee with you. So you can see that the viewers had a very personal relationship with Dinah. I mean, you could just see a housewife sitting down with her little portable TV in the kitchen, having a cup of coffee with Dinah three feet away from her. And they feel like they knew her. And besides that, she was so warm and open. So this young woman wrote in, she said, when I read that, uh, that you that you were dating Burt Reynolds, I decided to watch your show to see what he saw in you. And now that I've been watching, I can see that he's the lucky one. And I made sure Dinah saw that. 
everything was interesting. It was so interesting, the things that we did. You know, Larry Zonka, the fullback from the Miami Dolph Dolphins, we, we heard that he liked a particular kind of wine called Boar's Blood, B-O-A-R. So I went up in the office, I got out the phone book and I started calling liquor stores and we found a store that sold Boar's Blood. So somebody went out and bought it for Larry. Um, this is our beautiful letterhead. Now here, we had a good time. At the end of every cycle, we would have a party. In this particular case, we taped two days a week, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and the taping three shows a day would go until about 10 o'clock at night. In this case, Dinah had a full Southern buffet catered and brought onto the set, and we all ate the meal at 10 o'clock at night, and Dinah was out with her band dancing. She was dancing for another hour or two. Look at that figure. The guy on the left was part of the crew. The other guys are her music, or her band. And the one, the second from the right is John Rodby, a brilliant music director. Uh, this is Dinah and me on the same, on the same evening. Two cute little things. There was one show that she did, it was a Thanksgiving show, and Gene Kelly was the guest, and it showed Dinah and Gene seated across from each other and a big turkey in the center. And then the camera panned back and there's a big long table with about 24 people, and it was all of us. We were, the whole staff was at this table. It looked like Dinah and Jean were having this intimate uh, Thanksgiving dinner for two, but it was all of us. And a friend of mine actually saw it. She was on vacation in the Caribbean, wrote me a letter and said, I saw you on Dinah. And then another one I have to tell you that was so funny, Sammy Davis Jr. was on with his wife, Alta Vist. Now he had had you know, many storied relationships with Kim Novak and, and his wife, my Britt, but Altavis was the last one. And Altavis said for Sammy's birthday, she put, gave him a luncheon and all of his ex-girlfriends were invited. Now that took some guts, I would say. So this was all, all lots of fun. Um, I, I helped create a lot of the international shows. And when I took my booklet to Dinah's PR man, Charlie Pomerantz, to see if possibly I could go to work at a PR agency as a secretary. And he looked at this and said, Flo, you write too well to be a secretary. You can go to an agency as a publicist. And that's what I did. So that started my PR career, which I did for many years. Uh, the thing that was really sad is when the show ended, it was really done very unceremoniously. Uh, the sponsor Colgate had renewed the show for two years and so we thought maybe Dinah was not going to want to continue because uh, she was in the relationship with Burt Reynolds at that time but little did we know that NBC had apparently made the decision that her lead-in was not the lead-in they wanted for their game shows that followed her and they just basically sacked the show and you know she did not find out in a nice way and neither did any of us so this is the back of the cookbook where she's uh, sampling something that she has cooked and it's been quite a journey and i thank you all for coming along with me did you have any relationship after the show or that was it no, uh, no, I did with some of the people, some of the staff, but not Dinah, not Dinah herself. Flo, uh, earlier on, you showed Pierre Fernet on the sh on the thing on the uh, screen. It's one of the guests, and the reason you probably had him on the show was he was the author of the sixty minute gourmet that was on the bestseller list for twenty eight weeks, and it was a really easy book to follow. Well, thank you. If I give this talk again, I'll be sure to mention that. Thank you. Flo, this is Scott. Um, do you, I, I, I don't know if I should even ask this question, but I think it's okay. Can you tell any personal observations you had about Dinah Shore? What, what did you find her like? Did you have much of a personal relationship on the show or what, what was she like to work for? I mean, Burt Reynolds said about her, somebody said something negative about Dinah Shore once very unfairly. And he said, that's like spitting on the American flag. But, <laughs> uh, but I mean, I just have this wonderful, wonderful image of Dinah Shore. And she did have a degree in sociology, which maybe explained why she could talk about so many topics with her varied guests. But what, what was it like to, to be with her? I mean, what, what would you, how would you describe her personality up front? close like that. I will, I will tell you by describing something else. 
uh, Max Pittman, as I mentioned, is, he was an older guy. He was, we used to call him Uncle Max. And he, he was known as the best prop man in the business. And he said that the, the disposition on the set comes from the top. And we, we loved it. And because of Dinah being who she is, it was such a copacetic uh, environment to be on. And he mentioned another one. It was a very important uh, late night host, who apparently had a much different temperament and the atmosphere on that set was much different. So I think that that illustrates who she is, you know, and I've really, there are probably, you know, if there was something that, that was, was, was critical, you know, they, they have people to do that for them. But yes, she was a very lovely person. And, uh, and, and there's just no doubt about it. The question that was asked, it was like, I think it was from Veronica and it just says, what are some approaches? I think they're just saying, what are the influences? What are some things that Dinah did that you still see? Because a lot of times those of us who grew up with TV see those influences in later shows. And I think that's what she's asking is, what have you seen today in shows that, that might've been influenced by Dinah's yeah. show? Well, well, I have to say that I think that that certainly, certainly the expansive treatment of uh, food is yeah. something that you know that that is just exploded a thousandfold as of now. But I mean, even even this nice little lady show on the morning to have all these famous chefs on this is a that's a big deal. And also the international oh. foods, you know, we see that we take that all for granted now. But nineteen yeah. in the seventies, uh, no. And also, I think. I think being able to talk about various subjects, even the difficult subjects, and do it in it with decorum. Uh, just one quick one I'll mention: when she had so many of the of the uh, country singers on, and the singer Mel Tillis was a stutterer, and he came on, and he had part of his career he didn't try to to disguise it, but they had a, a doctor on who treated stuttering, so it was a topic that was talked about you know, in a very kind way, but in a very helpful way. So I think that, I think that that, that stuff may all come back to Dinah, to Dinah for all I know. And I thank you for the question. Uh, Jane Baker asked if any of her shows are still available on Netflix and such, or YouTube probably more likely. Yes, actually. Yeah, you just go and, and, and uh, search it. They are there, some. That's lucky, actually, because a lot of early, some very early television shows, people want yeah. even a Not even that early, but even later, though, you know, I used to love the Merv Griffin show. He used to do theme shows where he'd have like eight of the most prominent lawyers. And those shows were not saved, a lot of wow. them. You know, and that's tragic. Well, that, that film or whatever they were using is not easy to store and is volatile. So that's probably one of the reasons. And it's heavy. Any other questions? So if you had to do it over again, was this a good experience? Would you want to do it again? Or uh, you're, you're glad, but you could have lived without it? Just out of curiosity. That's a silly question. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, you, there's a left turn and a right turn. And you go and left and it's like, oh, that was a good idea. But well, to tell you the truth, I had, right. to tell you the truth, I had just gotten my teaching credentials. So I was, I was supposedly subbing, subbing for LA city schools and then I was registered with the temp agency. So yeah, I mean, it changed my entire life, but I'll tell you the one thing that might've been different is that I didn't really prepare for my retirement and I'm not retired, I would like to be. Uh, and if I had stayed teaching or something like that, I would have, uh, you know, I, that's, the only, that's the only thing. But I yeah, still, that's the, oh the yes, I'm, ha I'm happy I had the experience. Of course I am, I love it. And it was challenging every single day. Well, that's, that's, that's the kind of job I like is when I have to learn something new. Scott, anything else? No, I just wanna say Flo, thank you so much. Uh, uh, again, when I saw you do the show uh, from, from California, you know, for the culinary stories of Southern California, it, it just brought back all happy memories. And then when I Googled about Dinah, I realized, oh my God, she was better than I remember. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought it would be fun to bring you here to have a, a fun, reminiscent, nostalgia talk about, about uh, our past. And, and especially because Dinah was so involved with food. So thank you for, for bringing part of America's uh, most treasured history to us uh, uh, one about an American icon. 
And uh, thank you for a very meaty talk. So appreciate <laughs> it. And uh, I look forward to being in touch with you. And remember who your tour, tour guide is going to be when you come to Chicago. Absolutely. Okay, that's that's the promise. I you, well, I've signed a contract with you to be your tour guide when you come here. So look forward. And there's to witnesses. Yes, we still. Well, have you're a coming lot of too, them. Kathy. Yes. Oh, sure. Why not? Oh yes, she's the food guru. So thank you so much, and enjoy a few more hours of sunshine than we're going to have right now. So mm -hmm. take care. And, and look forward to seeing you someday soon. Thank you so much, Scott. Be good, everybody. You bet. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.